हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण क्षेत्र महाराज बलबे प्रभु थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर ज्वाइनिंग वंस अगेन फॉर द मॉन्स पॉडकास्ट हाउ इज माय प्लेजर वी कंप्लीटेड अ दशावतार सीरीज दैट वाज वन ऑफ द लॉन्ग एंड वेरी रिलेशनेबल सीरीज आई थॉट वी कुड मूव टू सम मोर कंटेंपरेरी और इंटेलेक्चुअल टॉपिक्स रिलेटेड योर एरिया ऑफ स्पेशलाइजेशन सो one topic i felt we could discuss is uh, how does uh, contemporary education uh, relate with spirituality so there are some of prabhupada statements which are sometimes quoted that prabhupada has uh, said that modern education is like a spiritual slaughterhouse mm. but is that a, like a fair or complete representation of prabhupada's position and one reason yeah. i thought we could discuss is because you are actively involved in the academia you you are a faculty and you teach in various universities so uh i'm i'm not a faculty oh. i'm not in any faculty now except bhaktivedanta college uh, but okay. anyway yes but you're teaching in i believe in singapore or china and the far east you're teaching i was in? teaching in hong kong hong kong okay. at the chinese university of hong kong um okay. you know I, i'm not a seasoned um teacher i i taught there for altogether six semesters as a uh, visiting scholar was my official designation okay actually the first year i was um i was assistant professor i was a regular enrolled person for the first two semesters and then after that i became uh for various reasons i it was best uh that i be a, a visiting scholar and um before that i taught as an ad- adjunct professor uh in university of florida for two semesters uh introductory courses in um study of religion especially religions of india and religions of asia oh okay mm. and then i've i've given what i call freelance lecturing in assorted universities <laughs> over the years uh in mainland china i've uh given some lectures okay and a, a few not a whole lot uh, but a few in other places in the west i've also taught um i taught a course i've taught different courses two or three different courses at one small university in croatia uh also in study of religion so that's my teaching uh that's pretty much the extent of my teaching uh outside of uh the vaishnava circles directly it's quite widespread you have asia you have europe and you have america so all three <laughs> and i think now you're teaching in the vvrc also here in india so yeah we just did a course for the new uh new brc students uh it was a course in um academic writing research academic? skills okay research, research skills. skills was the specific topic training students who are beginning masters programs and uh i guess two or three phd students at university of mumbai yeah oh okay so uh oh, now from my perspective also i was i did my engineering is another yes. good good universities in india you were so, at iit wasn't it well like one rung below iit i just oh. with the government engineering college pune so it was uh-huh. so it was a fairly good institute so mm-hmm. now i broadly thought about it that was the that in what way does education actually relate with spirituality in today's world mm-hmm. so i thought of three broad things one is the culture is quite uh, quite sensual that is one aspect of it the other is that i don't see much at least in the stem fields the content is not 
not anti spiritual directly but spirituality is not any way mentioned at all so in one yeah. sense you could say that sometimes it say that like neglect is the worst insult mm. so by neglecting people forget it if even it is criticized there is some interest but mm. so that could be another aspect to it and third is maybe it it creates a certain mentality where people start uh, um pursuing not just uh, sensuality during the time but overall materialism but then i thought that is that uh, all because in one sense from a positive perspective education does teach people to re- some reasoning skills education filters out the students who are ready to commit themselves work hard who have some talent who have some dedication and then if these students become spiritually mm-hmm. minded they they also become very committed spiritually so i would say like yeah. everything else there are pros and cons of the yes. modern education system but what are your thoughts about it well i thought first uh, since you mentioned prabhupad's comment about slaughterhouse i i did a little searching in the veda base and i thought it's good if we read uh, one one example of this okay and then maybe go from there this is from a room conversation july 9th 1973 in london revati nanana says yeah when mr birla is getting old then he has to come to us if he has any sense and prabhat says no they say they simply give primary education a b c d they can read that's all now before i continue i think they prabhat is speaking about is wealthy businessmen okay uh, that uh, they give basic education and that's they consider enough and sanskrit he says they don't send meaning they don't send to school because everyone knows that sending boys to the school means spoil them that's all i have seen intelligent boys they go to school and he is spoiled bus spoiled he learns how to smoke how to use sex <laughs> how to talk nonsense how to use knife how to fight these things at least at the present moment yes simply slaughterhouse this so called school is called colleges yes slaughterhouse yes slaughterhouse so i don't know how often how many times prabhat spoke of education as slaughterhouse i couldn't do a thorough search um but i i thought this is um you know representative so it's interesting here it seems the emphasis is on the first point you mentioned the culture uh the um mm. the degradation that that can be there i can say that when i uh went back to university because i dropped out of university uh before joining the devotees as a young man and then by the encouragement of uh senior my senior god brothers i went back to university 23 years later uh university of california uh changing campus from berkeley to santa barbara and i was a bit shocked at uh the degradation of language that i was hearing from students in that period of time uh it was an interesting experience just because of the more than two ta- two decades gap so if you know if you hear language changing gradually over time that's one thing but when you don't hear it for two decades and then you hear <laughs> it was oh, okay. for me it was such a shock 
at how degraded the language was and how, how inarticulate students had become. I mean, it seemed to me they had become more inarticulate than before. Uh, just, you know, hardly able to put <laughs> proper sentences together to say something intelligent. I was, I was quite amazed. So um, that, and then the, the culture, um, I was, when I went back to university in Santa Barbara, I stayed with um, a devotee. We shared an apartment. Um, we were uh, just one block away from the campus, and we were uh, just across the street from what's called a sorority house. Uh, there are fraternities. This is uh, for men students, and there are sororities for women students. And um, and these are private institutions. They're they're not. I don't know, directly connected with the university. And you, you have to be selected, uh, invited to be a member of a fraternity or sorority. They're kind of exclusive. Anyway, the, the, the yelling and screaming that we heard sometimes from the sorority was like a bit shocking. You know, what's going on over there? <laughs> oh, okay. and, and, it was, um, and and that's you know the women, and you wonder what are their parents, what are their parents, uh, how much are their parents aware of what's going on? So that was that was, I mean, it's very impressionistic, but that uh, that sense is there, as you say, a lot of sensuality is there, especially on Western campuses, but you seem to suggest that it's also uh, in Indian campuses. Yes, definitely. It's lesser than in the West. But yeah, as compared to what a child staying at home would be exposed to, what happens to them when they get exposed to colleges is definitely much more. Mm, yeah. Yeah, that one gets exposed uh, to, yeah, there's the sensuality. Um, there's, uh, I went, before I dropped out, I went to University of California, Berkeley. And Berkeley was a, it was sort of the center, it was the main hotbed of, uh, of political activism in America in the late 1960s and early 70s. So I was exposed to all of that along with, you know, the prevailing um, political fads, including Marxism of various stripes and, and so on. That was there, mm -hmm. but it was also, you know, it was a mix. That's where I was first exposed to, um, Krishna consciousness. There were devotees who were chanting, uh, doing public Harinam, um, right at the main entrance, main gate of the university, mm. every day, five days a week, uh, week in, week out, for several hours a day. So, <laughs> so it was a, it was a kind of. Um, it was a kind of a cultural circus at, at my university. I would say all kinds of things were going on there. Cultural circus. Okay, that's a very yeah. strong word. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. So yeah. Prabhupada says he does use this strong term, uh, slaughterhouse. And this led me to an interesting thought um, because... I remembered years ago um, Henry Ford, famous for uh, mm. creating the, the, the Ford Motor Company and um, 
especially the assembly line process of producing, mass producing cars, automobiles. Uh, as I know, as I've understood, and probably Ambarish Prabhu could correct us on this, but uh, that uh, Henry Ford was inspired for this assembly line idea from the Chicago slaughterhouse system. Uh, the assembly line process was first developed uh, in Chicago, as best I know, in, in the slaughterhouse, in the meatpacking industry. Um, and what this, my, if I can indulge a little, my line of thinking here was Prabhupada's mentioning slaughterhouse. And I think this is where we can see the dark side of the modern academic system is that it's very much about a commodification of knowledge and okay. a kind of mass production of knowledge. When I was teaching at Chinese University of Hong Kong, it's a very large university and uh, it's a very well established and very sort of upwardly mobile university uh, in effect, um, competing with the University of Hong Kong for the, the you know, first position in, in the city, in the territory of Hong Kong. Mm. And uh, what I came to realize uh, as I got to know a little bit of the culture among the scholars was that what I had already heard was very much confirmed, namely publish or perish. Oh. And, and if you want to move up on the, you know, grease, grease pole <laughs> of academic career. Okay. <laughs> Fortunately for myself, I didn't have to worry about this. I was a visiting scholar. I didn't have to worry about this at all. Um, mm. But you have to publish. And in order to publish, uh, you have to produce knowledge. You have to be manufacturing. You have to be creating knowledge, uh, which is then considered, uh, you know, of a, of a, quality which can be published in academic journals or academic books and so on. Anyway, so this, uh, this made me think, it, it put me back to Prabhupada's comments about uh, uh, education as slaughterhouse of education, uh, the slaughterhouse of education, that yes, in the sense... <coughs> Okay, there's the violence side of it. Obviously, this is a major concern. Uh, and, and we can say that uh, on the extreme end of our critique of modern education, we, want, we, we may want to say like this, Prabhupada is pointing out, it is killing uh, the inclination towards spiritual life for many people, uh, for many young people, the potential can very easily, and why can it, why is that so? We may want to say because um, modern education sponsored by the state is in essence a, a, a production line, uh, which is producing students or uh, producing workers educated workers who are able to go into uh, uh, the, the working world mm. in various capacities. 
That's so, a very interesting anyway. way. So there's also a visual metaphor. You could say that in a slaughterhouse, animals are lined together one after another. Yeah. And then they're slaughtered. So similarly, a assembly line, production house, commodification of knowledge. That is, especially when we go into, if there are small classrooms, it's different. But if there are like big universities with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of students, then things yeah. do become depersonalized. Mm. Yes, and and um, I can share an experience of that. Also, when I went back to university, because I had dropped out after two only two years of undergraduate, first I had to finish up. I had to resume uh, undergraduate study, and that meant there were certain requirements I had to complete. And one of the requirements was a science course an introductory science course. My major was religious studies, but still I had to do one uh, science course and there were a few options that I could take. Science for non-majors, they had such courses. So I selected a course in biology. I remember it was biology 22. That was the course number. <laughs> and there were about 200 students in the class. And the professor uh, would just give his lecture. And then um, I guess there were uh, sections. I don't even remember where there's sections. Maybe not. Maybe yes. That <laughs> I've already forgotten if we had graduate students giving smaller class sections. And then there would be exams. And the exam, uh, there was uh, a midterm and a final. And I just remember how uh, the proctoring of the exam was done. I mean, it was kind of intimidating. Uh, we were seated in this big uh, lecture hall. Uh, we had to have a, a, a seat, an empty seat between us. And then uh, the proctors, who were the graduate students, uh, would would be patrolling up and down the aisles, <laughs> watching. Oh, <okay. laughs> so, in other words, there's no culture of trust. You know, forget about trust. That that was pretty much out the window in that sort of uh, situation. Maharaj, just one point then, if we're talking about this, this seems to be more, uh, these are generic features of modern society itself. Are they features of uh, modern culture? Uh, I mean, are they specific to modern education? Like say erosion of trust or depersonalization, commodification. So then are we, we could at one level say then that the entire modern, modern society itself is a spiritual slaughterhouse. Are there anything well, so yeah. specific? Yes, and then different institutions are, are mirroring each other. So you, you go through the um, educational system, you have a certain way of understanding how things work in terms mm. of values, um, lack of trust in society and so on. And then you'll... Uh, reflect that in your your institution, your excuse me, corporation, whatever. Mm. And, and so it becomes also a kind of echo chamber. Yes. So we could say that the spiritual slaughterhouse is maybe a just a it's a, like a reflection of the overall secularization of modern society in general as security as. Overall, society has become secularized in terms of becoming uh, removing God or any spiritual element from the from the society. Yeah, secularization. Uh, that's of course a huge topic, and I've just been reading a book a little bit in preparation for our discussion, okay. um, but I don't feel like I've. Uh, absorbed the ideas, but it's a very good book called The Decline of the Secular University by 
uh, one uh, C. John Somerville, who is a professor of history, a retired professor emeritus uh, from University of Florida. And he's essentially arguing that it is going to be seen if it's not already recognized that uh, secularity and secularism, he, he makes distinctions. There's secularization, there's secularity, and there's secularism. Uh, have, their, have their problems, their inbuilt limitations and problems, and that good arguments can be made for bringing religious positions, religious uh, points of view into the university for serious discourse because of the popularity and so on. And there are, of course, many different types of secularity. So the the British, the British, the the Indian Constitution uh, declares in its, I think, in its preamble that this is a secular state. Yes. That India is a secular state. Yes, it um, is. not in the core document of the Constitution, but it is there as a part of the subsequent body. Oh, I thought it's right in the preamble, but okay. Um, but there, but the Indian secularity is significantly different from the American secularity in terms of how they deal with religions. Uh, this, the, the so-called separation of uh, church and state, what they say in America. Uh, one of the things that Somerville does in this book is point out that the, actually that separation is an illusion. It's impossible because uh, we're dealing with values um, in all, all spheres of life. There are uh, presumed values, spoken or unspoken. And where there are values, you can pretty, be pretty much sure you can trace them back to some religious position. Um, anyway, so you were saying about secularity. So this it's an interesting thesis. So he's making two points from what I understood that, that first of all, there is reason for having these ideas in the academy and actual separation doesn't and does it actually happen also in a sense. Yeah. So so you know, I was reading one Jewish author. He says that throughout history religions have fought uh, with each other for a long time, but in modern modern few decades or maybe few centuries, religious wars themselves have been relatively less, especially in Europe after the Protestant. So he says that to some extent, his argument, that secularism embodies a certain amount of humility on the form of the government. That we are mm. not, we, we are not going to tell people what to believe. So in that sense, when we don't encroach on people's moral and spiritual lives, and when we means the state doesn't encroach, so then that uh, that helps people to live, people with different beliefs to live together without mutual conflicts. So, like in today's world, to avoid secularism, I don't know how would we have education? Would we uh, seculariz secularization is is isn't it somewhat something like a necessary fact of life nowadays? How would we have universities in today's world hmm. where we are so multicultural? <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. I, I, I'm not, hmm. I, I'm, uh, I'm feeling that I'm on uncertain ground here myself because I know that uh, the idea of secularity, you've, you've given some aspects of it that hmm. are there. Uh, there are other aspects of it, though, uh, as a result of some of what you said, uh, it leads to the privatization of religion. Okay, yes. Where the, the state is saying, uh, you can all believe whatever you want, just 
uh, you know, shelf or keep it inside your church, uh, which sounds from one side like a nice clean solution <laughs> to minimize or avoid conflict among people. There are problems. Problems arise when you talk about uh, privatization of religion or the necessity of religion becoming uh, private, private, privatized. Uh, it, it should stay in the home and at most in the church, but should not come out into the public square. Um, it, it can be another problem because the nature of religion is it has to do with the whole of reality. So how mm. do you contain <laughs> how do you contain that which you know is not to be contained? It's like we we understand the essential practice uh, for this age is is sankirtan, and you know we feel that it is essential to be able to go into public and perform sankirtan. Mm -hmm. There are many countries where it's not possible, and we feel highly highly uh, restricted because of that. In fact, where we are uh, free to do Harinam, unfortunately, I would say, many uh, devotees don't actually appreciate that we have this opportunity, that, we're, that we are able, because in so many places we, we are not able. That's another subject. Mm, um, okay. But the sort of, um, the, one of the, consequences of secularization is uh, the sort of confinement of religion uh, to, to the private sphere. Now, another way of looking at this, I think, uh, may be helpful, is from the late uh, Professor Houston Smith. He was a scholar of religion yes, quite a in America. Moment. A well-known person. He wrote yes, he classic was, books on religion and, and world religions. He wrote classic books. Yes, they became practically classics. I was fortunate to meet him in Berkeley. We had lunch together. Uh, very, very nice gentleman. Oh, okay. One, one of the last books that he wrote, uh, if not the last book, uh, was called "Why Religion Matters." Matters. Yes, I you know the book. Yeah, I read it, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're familiar. You know that he speaks about uh, the problem of tunnel vision. Yes. Talks about and he that. said that this tunnel has four sides. One of the sides is, I think he called it scientism. I think scientism, media, culture, education, like that. Yes. Four tunnels, something like that. Sci scientism, media... Uh, the legal system and oh, education. Legal system, okay. Yeah. So his, his broad point is that all of these are um, having the net result in our modern society of giving everyone tunnel vision. Tunnel vision means, you know, having a very narrow view of, mm -hmm. uh, of reality. And this argument that secularism holds, you know, sort of prevents um, fighting amongst religions, I, th I think that it's not completely satisfactory. And I would say so because... It seems to me, and I think this is what Somerville is arguing, that if we would take modern, uh, modern public education and encourage it to develop to a greater maturity, it could uh, educate, it could facilitate the education of people to appreciate the value in religious traditions other than one's own. Mm -hmm. 
and could uh, could instill values of respect and and appreciation and and I don't mean simply tolerance. Tolerance is a negative value. Okay, I don't like anything about you. Uh, I don't like anything about what you believe, but I'm going to tolerate you, which is pretty much what we see in India um, is often championed or celebrated, you know, that, uh, oh, we Hindus are very tolerant. Um, but what is tolerance? <laughs> you know, Hindus have... <laughs> For the most part, I'm generalizing, but most Hindus have no interest in finding out um, what it is about, let's say, Christianity or Islam, uh, which might, uh, might be valuable. You know, the word Islam means surrender. So isn't that interesting for us, for a Vaishnava to know? Um, so... I, I think education, public education, could be uh, developed in such ways as to allow for okay. deeper appreciation and opening up this, you know, getting away from the tunnel uh, vision. I think that's One thing the that's happening in, in the United Kingdom, in Great Britain, they seem, my impression is, they have a quite strong program of what they call religious education in uh, the primary and secondary schools. It's public education. And I know about this uh, from Rasamandala Prabhu, my godbrother, who uh, in the UK, who's now working on a PhD at Cambridge University. Yeah, he, he has been there on a podcast for a couple of times. Yes. He was a pioneer for education, I think. Uh, in yes, Hinduism. in Hinduism. Yes. Yes. And he's, he's authored or co-authored, I think he's authored at least one book uh, used as a textbook in, um, in the UK. So that sort of thing, you know, is, is possible. Hmm. And that sort of thing is, I think, very much missing uh, in okay. India today. Okay, so what you're saying is that uh, if there is no mention of religion in education, it's not that that will go out of the out of the culture or the minds of people. It is going to be there, and then yeah. there'll be all kinds of preconceptions and misconceptions that might come in, biases and all those might come in. But if there yeah. is a more objective kind of uh, there's objective kind of education, it needn't be proselytizing, but it can be just informing about, say, what these various religious systems are about. Yes, and, and also, also yeah. on a higher level, there can also be uh, proper, there can be debate. Um, maybe not in primary school, maybe not in secondary school, but in tertiary, uh, there can be debate where, uh, you know, standards of, of reasoning are demanded um, such that everyone really has to give their best. Um, another point about the secularization argument, it was believed by sociologists up until um, 1960s and maybe early 70s, that religion was bound to disappear in course of time. Yes. And okay. then they started discovering in the 60s and 70s that that's absolutely not true. <laughs> mm. so it, it seems that I was in Australia and they had a interfaith dialogue and I was asked to present our movement. The topic was, why has God not died till now? <laughs> Quite a problem. <laughs> <laughs> we thought he was going to die by now. He's still alive. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Friedrich Nietzsche said, 
said God is dead. Uh, yeah. Everyone quotes only that part. They they don't they leave out the second part. He said God is dead, and we have killed him. Yeah, and he didn't say it in a celebratory tone. He says no. that the ocean is going to that the skies are going to fall down and the earth has no center now. Mm. Yeah, and he he had it, and that was spoken by a madman. He said, a madman runs out into the marketplace and yells, mm. God is told and we have been deterred. <laughs> That's <clears throat> interesting. So, so in one sense, uh, if edu- you're saying that education can be information and there can be a healthy culture of debate. Yeah, that could be actually very helpful because in today's world, conflicts degenerate into name calling and ass- character assassination. I don't know how many people have ever been trained in how to debate. Yeah. It's, it's almost if you oppose me or if you, then it's not just that you are wrong, but you are wrong headed. You are a mean person. It becomes and, like and, that. And maybe evil. <laughs> evil, yeah. <laughs> and, and therefore, at a certain point with that mentality, communication stops. And then what is, what, what other option is there than to fight? Yeah. And that means eventually physical fight. And there are traditions of, of debate. We have our own traditions. Uh, the Vedic tradition, you know, Nyaya uh, speaks of different qualities of, uh, of debate. Uh, but also very fascinating I, that I came across um, some time ago in Tibetan Buddhism. Mm. They have a tradition of uh, training the monks in debate. And it, okay. it's, quite, it's quite intriguing. You can see um, probably there's something on YouTube where you see them like, um, you, you, you see it's a quite physical activity. And there's a certain ritual quality to it, but they're um, very animated in the way they're interacting. Um, but it's it's also it's very structured. But it's debate. They are uh, debating ideas. They are taking the challenges to their tradition, and then they are responding to them. So. I think that's also missing from our own institution. We, Prabhupada wanted to encourage, he encouraged devotees to, you know, take the, uh, to pose as materialists and so on. Mm. But we haven't really developed that in a, in a very serious way. Uh, because in a serious way would mean that we seek out uh, practitioners of other traditions, including, you know, Advaita Vedanta, Mayavada, whatever, <laughs> you know, yeah, and, and be ready to uh, address, respond to them. Yeah. It's one thing, you know, we do a lot of shadow boxing. Shadow boxing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, in one sense, oh, uh... Shadow boxing one word, it's like straw man, it's sometimes also straw man arguments. Yeah. Like we, we represent we represent them often at their weakest arguments and yeah. then we smash them. Yeah. Mm. It's a lot of fun, but <laughs> <laughs> a lot of fun. Okay. Yeah. It makes us feel good. <laughs> so Maharaj, then in general, here there's this uh, there's this injunction that don't read any books other than Prabhupada's books. In fact, don't even read. I mean, there are some devotees who also have that. Don't read even uh, other devotees' books. Just focus on Prabhupada's books. So, is that mm-hmm. something uh, more for the initial stages where one wants to solidify one's faith? And then, in one sense, for those who are intellectuals, foods are their nar- books are their nourishment, and yeah. uh, to restrict them to uh, one set of books or one perspective that is not going to really equip them or equip them for the outreach that they can do, nor is it going to uh, satisfy their intellectual needs and hunger. 
Yeah, I think there's a couple of things here. One is, is Adhikar, um, Adhikar in two senses. One is, one may think of it as, as progression of advancement, but we have to be really careful about that. Um, but the other is um, more like in terms like we think of, like Varna, you know, uh, someone who has a certain capacity for a certain kind of service may need for his or her service a certain kind of training which we will not find in Srila Prabhupada's books. That's a bold um, statement to make. I mean, yeah, well, uh, <laughs> I'll, <laughs> I'll get into trouble with it. Put it, but, but, but that's only half of what I want to say is yeah. that one, one learns something, a certain skill, let's say a kind of debating skill, and then, and then at some point one may come back and realize actually it is there in Prabhupada's books. It's there in his, maybe not in his books, but his conversations. Uh, or it's there in seed form, uh, in certain statements within the Bhagavatam, uh, or in the statements of uh, the Goswamis. Now, and, and going back to your point, read only Srila Prabhupada's books. Problem with that statement is that Prabhupada himself didn't say it. Um, really? I mean, he may have said it in some contexts, but in other contexts, okay. he was encouraging. Um, he was encouraging. It was um, you had interview with um, Jayadvaita Swami Maharaj, mm -hmm. uh, where he said, you know, the BBT Prabhupada encouraged that some books other than Prabhupada were, were published. Yeah, um, that's true. Satsuru Maharaj's um, book. The readings in Vedic uh, literature. Scientific yeah, literature, readings in Vedic about, literature. Then Scientific Basis else. of Krishna Consciousness by Bhaktisuddhan Maharaj. Right. And Prabhupada is quite proud of that, actually. Yeah. So, so those are indications. And another sort of indication we could take that Srila Prabhupada encouraged um, he instructed, we can say, Ravinder Saru Prabhu to continue to complete his study, uh, to complete his doctorate. He was, he was studying uh, religion, study of religion uh, at Temple University. And Prabhupada said, yes, go ahead and complete it. And... Um, and Prabhupada at times spoke of having a libraries in which there would be um, a wide range of books. He, he did say, we just don't want the nonsense books. And he was referring specifically to some uh, Neo-Vedanta mm -hmm. writers and, and such like that. He, he had no, no tolerance for them. Um, but he he wanted he wanted devotees to be learned. If mm. devotees, if some at least some devotees don't become learned in ways which can be represented in the wider world, based in Srila Prabhupada's books, certainly. Mm. And therefore, again, what I wanted to say is starting with and always continuing with Prabhupada's books as the basis. And on that basis, being able to read what may be appropriate for one's service and to re read a, which is not going to, you know, pull one away altogether from, uh, from our, our understanding of Krishna consciousness. True. But that's that's uh, to to do that properly. Then I think needs guidance, and and that's and for that 
there is need for a culture and that culture is something which uh, our society is hopefully developing um, over time. And that leads into, I think, your other topic, that there are more and more devotees mm. uh, doing higher education. Yes, Maharaj. Can but I'm sort of rambling. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, I, I'm just thinking about it. That So overall, that now that I'm thinking about Prabhupada's books overall, so when I came to, when I was introduced to Krishna consciousness and uh, in the early years, that modern education of the spiritual slaughterhouse seemed to be like a almost a standard or a very central understanding of Prabhupada's position about education. But over the years, as I've read Prabhupada's Bhagavatam, CC, and uh, other books also, it doesn't seem to be that that central of his position. In, in one sense, Prabhupada even says that education is demoniac. So mm. and that is just Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha is one part of human life. Mm. So it would be quite a reductionistic way to look at Prabhupada's position on education as just referring to the slaughterhouse. So, yeah. Mm. I think one point would be to take into account Srila Prabhupada's own uh, exposure to modern education. He attended Scottish Church's college. Yeah. Um, apparently, he was a good student. Mm. He uh, studied philosophy and what else was it? Um, English literature also, I think, he studied. English literature, yeah. And he qualified for uh, a degree at the end, which, of course, we know famously he rejected uh, for political reasons at the time. He yeah. was a, a follower of, of Gandhi, and uh, this was a major way of protesting uh, the British presence uh, the British rule in India was to reject his uh, his diploma, but he did go through the system, and I would I think it could be argued that he applied a lot of what he learned in his preaching. Hmm. He shows in his preaching a wide awareness of the ways of the world, if you like. Um, I, I can't give examples right now, but it, 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 he shows this awareness, and, and he sometimes would point to some examples uh, from, you know, Christian tradition or whatever. Wow. Um, and how does, he, how, how does he do that? It was because he had that education. And so we can say he used that education in Krishna's service. Mm. So that would be one, one, one point to think about when trying to determine what was Srila Prabhupada's overall approach to modern education. Yes. And another, I mean, I fully agree with this. I think Prabhupada sometimes would quote Shakespeare. I had a podcast with... Uh, <clears throat> Maharaj, and he told me, we discussed, about he's one of his area of interest is world classical literature. Yes. So he said that apparently, Pro, uh, I think you have also interviewed him about the Bhagavatam on your Bhagavatam channel. I've yeah. seen that. So he said that apparently when Prabhupada was in England, he gave a whole talk on Hamlet. So I asked him whether, whether it was recorded. He said no, it was like an informal discussion. Uh -huh. he, so who told him? <laughs> I forgot who mentioned that. So it was quite striking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, and Prabhupada, of course, um, did all of these uh, dialogues or conversations um, first with Hayagriva Prabhu and then with Shamasundar Prabhu and possibly one more devotee about different Western scholars, uh, which was published eventually in a book called Dialectical Spiritualism. Yes. That was published in New Vrindavan. Um, and most of those conversations, um, one can point to many faults 
in the representations that Hayagriva and Shamasundar gave of those <laughs> uh, of of the scholar of the philosophers, representations or misrepresentations or extremely partial representations. But it gave Srila Prabhupada a kind of, you know an opportunity to generally he would condemn them. He would say, well that's that's a misguided idea. Um, and then he would highlight uh, a higher point of Krishna consciousness. Occasionally he would agree with some point that was being made by one of the philosophers. Okay. Yeah, it seems that Prabhupada must seem to be quite uh, appreciative of Carl Jung, for example. He says, he mocks, he's the most sensible among them. So Prabhupada said something like that. Uh, appreciated who? Carl Jung. Carl Jung, yes. Carl Jung, yeah. Mm. That's interesting. Another way I was thinking, Maharaj, is that if we look at the opposite, if spiritual if modern education is like a spiritual slaughterhouse, does the lack of modern education make people spiritually receptive? Uh, we could say maybe in the in the Indian in villages in India, people are pious and they take up to take they take up to Krishna consciousness quickly. But mm. it's not entirely true because often the villagers they have their own local deities and local godmen and local forms of worship. And without education, they may have some generic faith, but from that generic faith to a specific commitment where they, mm -hmm. they commit themselves to one spiritual path, it doesn't always happen that easily. Mm -hmm. So we could say education, if education was slaughter, education is slaughtering people, then is it that the uneducated are say unslaughtered or spiritually vibrant? <laughs> I don't know whether that, that is true. The, uns the unslaughtered masses. <laughs> the unslaughtered. <laughs> like oh, there's God. the expression, the unwashed masses. Yeah. Unwashed masses. <laughs> yeah, I know, that's true. <laughs> it's used in what sense? Unwashed masses? I just... uh, yeah, it's, I, I don't know the origin of that. It's some British thing, but uh, yeah. sort of the, the masses, you know, the unwashed, the, the, the uncultured uh, the uncultured people they're called the unwashed mass. Yeah, the, the uneducated, <laughs> informal culture. They're contrasted with the hoi poloi. Is that how it's pronounced? The hoi poloi. <laughs> hoi poloi, yeah. Hoi poloi. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And even if we say that would apply in India, it would apply only in India, isn't it? If, say, we had to go to the villages in Russia or villages in America, and we, assuming... I don't know it's a fair equalization, but assuming that in villages people are uneducated, would that make them more spiritually receptive just because they are uneducated in some where there is no, no Vedic culture? I don't think that they would have anything to do with uh, Krishna consciousness so much. Not anything to do, but so it, it does seem that well, the, they, they, the dancing, singing, they might like. And in the yeah, I was going to say, they may immediately... I mean, not in American villages, but in, yeah. you know, African villages, um, you know, yeah, why not? Hare Krishna. And we, I think Indra Maharaj had that book, Drums Along the Amazon, where he talks about yeah. his, the receptivity of the uh, people along the Amazon yeah. coasts. Yeah. So, so that kind of, that, that, there may be a certain level of receptivity and... Uh, we may even want to say it's it's the most important in terms of having an initial st a start, a certain simplicity of openness, uh, which could lead then to a deeper commitment, but probably would not, I think, as you're saying, without considerable um, considerable education. I mean, we, we, we put a lot of emphasis in our society on reading Srila Prabhupada's books, right? Mm. Although Prabhupada also sometimes says, if you can't read, that's okay, just chant Hare Krishna. Uh, <laughs> or if, but for the most part, it seems like our, our tradition is very much rooted in 
a presupposition of considerable education. Chaitanya Charitamrita was written as a product of uh, the culture of the six Goswamis in Vrindavan hmm. with the sense that there's a need uh, for the teachings of the six Goswamis to be, um, to be brought, to be transported um, to Bengal because in Bengal there were so many different ideas of who is Lord Chaitanya and what his teachings were about. Mm. Uh, and so for that reason mainly, Krishnadas Kaviraj was commissioned to write Chaitanya Charitamrita in Bengali, of course, with many, many quotes in Sanskrit, but then he generally gives a, a Bengali translation or purport to the Sanskrit. Um, but then in Bengal at that time, people would have been hearing Chaitanya Charitamrita. They wouldn't be yes. reading. The only, only a few people would be reading Chaitanya Charitamrita. But also this points to another thing that we're talking about modern times indeed when we're talking about modern education. And I was just reading that uh, in... Um, first, uh, that the vast majority of people would have been illiterate, including, you know, wealthy people, uh, people of considerable public influence and so on. Akbar was illiterate, <laughs> if we want to go oh, to India. Really? Yeah, he was, he was illiterate. He saw no need. Why should he learn to read? There was no need. He could have his, uh, his scribes uh, read aloud to him and write and so on. My God, eh? it's difficult to imagine in today's world a person going to any place of influence without being able to be literate. Yeah, and he was the emperor. <laughs> oh, God. So are you saying that, uh, I mean, what is the implication you are making by this, that in the past it was a culture where oral tradition was, but yeah, writing was not required? Or how, how are you connecting that with this point with education as such? Um. Well, oral traditions were certainly stronger than they are today, and people would have uh, learned quite thoroughly uh, the texts. In fact, that was an essential component of oral culture is memorization. Hmm. And there's a very nice book about this, um, uh, which you may be interested in. It's called religious reading, uh, the place of reading in the practice of religion. Oh, okay. And it was, it was written by uh, Paul J. Griffiths at the University of Chicago. And um, his main argument, incidentally, this is now a bit jumping to the side, but his main argument is a very powerful argument that um, that practically speaking, all of the reading that goes on in the university today is what he calls consumer reading. Okay, consumer reading. Yeah, where you, you buy the book and you read the book or you just read parts of the book that you need for your particular purpose. Or you borrow it from the library or you download it. In any case, you take from it, you consume whatever it is that is of immediate purpose for your purpose, whatever that might be. That's cons and, and so the culture of education today tends to be based on that kind of reading. And what he's doing in this book is arguing that um, 
what he calls um, religious reading has become almost completely lost, even in religious traditions, even amongst religious traditions. Um, and then he gives, he has what, three or four chapters where he goes into great detail about uh, how different religious traditions have had uh, reading practices of what he calls religious reading uh, in their, within their tradition. He talks about a Buddhist tradition, uh, an early Christian tradition. And this brings me back uh, to the point about orality um, and, okay. and reading is that so in he's- one sense, you are, Sorry, one he's, are you using the word readings in a paradoxical sense? The readings refers to like a book being read out aloud in that sense, the parts of oral tradition? Well, um, that's what I'm getting to, okay, is sorry. that in this Christian tradition, Going back to the time of, um, of Augustine, we're talking 5th century uh, mm. in North Africa, the vast majority of people could not read, and so mm. they were being read too. But in order to be inducted into the community of the Christian church, there were, I think it, uh, he describes, four stages uh, of bringing them eventually to the point of baptism and so on. And uh, to qualify, they were hearing scripture and memorizing scripture. Hmm. And they had to, uh, there was a system which is still called in the Catholic Church catechesis, uh, a kind yeah. of indoctrination, <laughs> but it, it involved a lot of memorization. But Griffiths is making another point with religious reading, mm. a broader point, and that is whether we're just hearing it or whether we're reading, uh, what constitutes religious reading is that it brings about a uh, if it's effective, it brings about a worldview which has three features. One is uh, it is comprehensive. Mm. Second, one sees it as insurpassable. Okay. And third, one sees it as central, central cool. to one's life. Okay. Uh, or we may say essential to one's life. It's not just, you know, a weekend hobby. It's, it's central to one's life. And he's saying that religious reading is something where you, you read again and again and again, and you discuss, as, as we try to do in our culture, reading uh, our, our texts, Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charitamrita, Nectar of Devotion. Um, and, and so, um, yeah, I just wanted, I brought, I brought in Griffith's book because he points to a reading culture in which there was the vast majority of people not able to read. So in response to your point that, you know, villagers may not take it seriously. Um, if there would be this culture of reading, you know, by let's say mm. the, the village Brahmins, <laughs> then one could imagine a situation where um, people would take it in a, in a very serious way. Mm. Yes, Maharaj. I was also thinking that uh... So, in one sense, they are actually not, not entirely uneducated. That is their education, mm. in a sense. They might not have they, formal education in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of literacy, and uh, they might not be part of the education system. Yeah. But they are here. Yeah. Well, that's another interesting thing is in the West, where does this idea come from that uh, one needs any kind of formal education? Um, 
it goes back to um, the time of Plato, basically, in ancient Greece. And there was a sense that some sort of intentional work needs to be done for a person, for a child to become an adult. <laughs> it That's was all about... Interesting. Okay. It was all about okay. making, bringing, bringing a child to becoming adult. So rather than what might have been prior to that in ancient Greece, that you know parents just kind of naturally brought up their kids uh, to learn whatever they learned and uh, to have the skills that they have and so on. Now there was a beginning, a sense that something more is needed. Uh, and okay. that seems to come in around the time of Plato. Plato also was responding to a fear. I just read about this. It's, it's fascinating that uh, Plato was responding to a certain fear that a new cultural wind was coming into Athens through the theater, <laughs> because an, a new law was passed uh, in the year 386 before the Common Era hmm. uh, that said that it is permitted to re-perform a drama to make a repeat performance of a drama which previously the tradition was that these you know great and famous uh, Greek dramas of Aeschylus and Aristophanes he was the humorist um, whoever they all were Sophocles that um, those were originally performed once and once only. Oh, really? And why was that? Because that was a religious event. Oh, so it's almost like people were expected to be Shrutidhar, as we say in our tradition. You hear it, you watch the drama and you experience it and that's it. So was that's it, once, it once in one place or once okay. in entire life of... As I understand, it was once in one place. Okay. Because it was also part of a competition. Uh, they were competing who, okay. who has the best drama. But anyway, uh, the point that what I was reading from one scholar is mm. that it was, uh, it was a religious experience. Okay. Now to say, well, actually now it's okay, we can repeat that performance. Uh, for Plato, that was the beginning of the end, uh, because this was now going to be a kind of the beginning of a degradation uh, in which what was needed in order to preserve, preserve culture now was going to be philosophy. Oh. So in one sense, what he was saying is by just by repeating the dramas, then no more the dramas wouldn't actually preserve the culture. In effect, that's my understanding. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, we're, we're, we're talking about beginnings of education as creation or the, the emergence in the, in the West mm. of the idea that... Uh, uh, there's need for a conscious and organized effort beyond the family uh, of making a child into an adult. There's, there's a history to that. That also it, seems to echo the Gurukul system where the child has to go away from the parents to stay yeah. in the Gurukul or somewhere else. Where, yeah. And now just... Going on with that earlier point, Maharaj, that we're talking about education, is it a, in what ways is it detrimental? How much of the content of the education itself works against spirituality in today's world? 
Mm. The, one one way could say is that there is if there is like in India at least there is no religious education in the mainstream education system. So that neg- negligence could lead to misconceptions or whatever at absence. But um, uh, is there anything in the education system that actively works against uh, religion? Well, again, perhaps we can start with Sheila Prabhupada's frequent statement. I don't, I didn't uh, look for an, an exact quote here, but. Many times he would kind of challenge, where is your department uh, for studying the soul or for studying the difference between a living body and a dead body? Yes. <laughs> I think he, excuse me, I think he said that a few times uh, when speaking to the scientist devotees, to Swarup Damodar Prabhu and others, uh, he was Tell, telling how they could challenge that. Where is your department for studying the difference between a living body and a dead body? <laughs> it is an interesting way yeah. of putting it. <clears throat> and uh, that little challenge got me thinking uh, back to Taitiriya Upanishad, where, as you know, we have this, this notion of the self encased in uh, in the koshas, right? So you have annamaya kosha, pranamaya kosha, uh, manamaya kosha, jnanamaya or vigyanamaya, and then anandamaya kosha. Hmm. And what strikes me, and I haven't, try to develop this at all, but it seems one could make an argument that modern education is uh, preoccupied with the first three of these koshas, anamoya, pranamoya, and manamoya, uh, with, uh, okay. with vigyanamaya, we might want to say, <coughs> is to some extent um, a concern in modern education, but perhaps it's more of a concern in religious uh, institutions of higher education. And I do want to point that out. We do have in the world, um, still today, <laughs> outside the secular sphere, you can say, um, higher educational sphere uh, institutions. Um, we have, th- they exist in India, they exist in the West, um, and there are Christian, there are Jewish institutions, uh, there are uh, Islamic institution, Muslim, there are Vedic or post-Vedic, however you wanna put it, institutions, and I mentioned before, there's Tibetan Buddhists. There, there are such institutions. So they, we may want to say, are concerned with Vigyanamoya and perhaps even Anandamoya in some degree. Okay. So this might be a helpful way of, of one way of thinking about this. Um, and another way we might want to see the, we may want to see this as a product of the attention to anamoya, pranamoya, manamoya, uh, okay. is to notice how modern education is, uh, involves a fragmentation of knowledge. I mean, from quite early, um, when, in, when I was going to elementary school, um, in, the early, in the early years, first, second, third, fourth grade maybe, we had one teacher uh, for every, every subject, but they were called subjects, and you had different textbooks for different subjects. Hmm. And then uh, 
of course, you get into high school and then you had different teachers for the different subjects, along with different textbooks and additional, um, additional books. Now, look at a different way of education. I often like to remember I, I know you've had interviews with Radhika Raman Prabhu, perhaps wow. also discussing how he was educated by his mother, uh, yes. Arud Hamataji, and it was basically um, it was basically everything from Bhagavatam, right? Yes, and they had quite open discussions about it. So it was not dogmatic, but it was it was the source was one, but the attitude was yeah. quite open. In terms of having discussions, yeah. Yeah, so they would have as their kind of root text Bhagavatam and then, and then from there. So, but fragmentation of knowledge has reached a super extreme in the higher levels, uh, such that specialization becomes... Um, kind of an absolute necessity if you want to if you want to be uh, a participant in the modern education system mm. to the point where especially in the sciences but even in in the so-called humanities uh, you can read titles of of academic papers and have absolutely no clue what they're talking about <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so, are you saying that because as spiritual, we are integral beings, but when the education becomes very fragmented, then that also obscures our essence? Is, how are you connecting that with... Uh... Yeah, that would be, I think, an, an important point. That, uh, spirit, we, you know, we th throw around this word spiritual. What is that? What is spiritual? What, is the, what, is it, what do we mean by that? One thing we may want to understand about it is we're talking about the whole person. Mm. And the whole person goes beyond uh, the body, the mind, uh, the emotions, and, and even the intellect, right? That's kind of square one. We understand from Bhagavad Gita that this, uh, the self... Even if we don't want to separate self from body, because there's a lot of resistance to that in modern thought. But mm. if we just say the whole self, then that's very difficult to talk about in the, in the present, uh, uh, the present uh, world of, of education. It's very difficult because of this fragmentation, specialization. That's fascinating. Now, fascinating in the sense that, uh, yeah, it's almost like we Krishna talks about his concept of knowledge in the mode of ignorance in 1822. So where we get what earlier you mentioned about Houston sits a tunnel vision that we might get mm -hmm. so consumed in our own discipline that we become oblivious even to, you could say, totality of material reality, They're not to speak of spiritual reality. Mm. Yeah. It's also a problem. Uh, this is something that um, Riddhainanda Das Goswami Maharaj likes to speak about is the fact that scientists, for the most part, have little or no training in philosophy. So even if we take philosophy as spiritual, but philosophy in some broader sense of uh, understanding, scientists don't get it. And as a result, the tendency, the, the scientific, uh, the popular scientific narrative uh, is that you know, science is providing us with all knowledge. And of course, that's not science, that's scientism. Mm. Um, but um, I'm, what I'm saying there is fragmentation, even which perpetuates, I think, uh, the lack of 
a recognition of the need for spirituality, uh, for a spiritual dimension, and a culture of spiritual life. Uh, and so take this science philosophy uh, uh, blindness, the way science gets presented, leaving out the recognition of the limitations of science means that the tunnel vision of which Houston Smith talked about uh, is perpetuated. So true. So you could, in one sense, uh, we have had phenomenal scientific advancement in knowledge, but it's almost like extending the tunnel further and faster, but not really coming out of the tunnel. <laughs> further and faster, yeah. We have very fast traveling through the tunnel, but the tunnel never ends. <laughs> well, yeah. and perhaps related to this, what is it that's... Um, maintaining modern education in financial terms. Uh, it's, it's the whole economic system. And this is maybe, you know, invoking a bit of Marx, Marxism, but what is it that's driving the system? It's, there has to be money. And, and uh, the money is coming from an economy what is driving that economy? It's an essentially an extractive economy, uh, which is what's destroying our environment, our, our eco ecological balance, and so on. And there's no indication that this extractive economy is slowing down. It's continuing to be perpetuated by the educational system, which exists for that purpose, essentially, to maintain the machinery and to expand the machinery uh, of an extractive economy. So now uh, we talk about sustainable development. Mm. Uh, sustainable development, isn't that an oxymoron? <laughs> you know... <laughs> I never thought of that. <laughs> That's so simply true. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's a whole other discussion, right? But if we think about how okay. um, modern education is is the it's it's the motor, you know, that's that's keeping that whole understanding. And, and way of, of moving in the world uh, going, it, it, then, then we step back and we ask, so where's the spirituality in modern education? Yeah, where is it? Because it has another purpose, basically. Mm. It's yeah. driving an extractive economy. Um, which, you know, where is that stopping? So then we could also say that, that it's if extractive economy could be related with Rajoguna and Tamoguna. And so we can say yeah. that the modern education not Ugra only karma. Yeah, Ugra karma not only perpetuates or fuels Rajas and Tamas, but also it may end up giving intellectual justification for those things. And that could also lead to further alienation from sattva and uh, shuddha sattva. Yeah. And, and also the psychology of education, by which I mean uh, the, the overall mentality of students to be successful, uh, they're under ever-increasing pressure uh, it's an interesting phenomenon in China today. Uh, I was just interviewed a few days ago by a lady um, in China um, for some, I think, a kind of yoga journal. And uh, she, she made this point that in China today, there's 
two things happening. There's extreme comp competitiveness, especially in education, but you know, from top to bottom throughout the economy. And uh, there's developing now since recently, what did she call it? A lie down culture. Lie down, where, okay. Yeah, where some, some young people are saying, hey, I'm out of here. This is a waste of time. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do it. I can't do it. <laughs> I refuse. <laughs> oh, it's a little okay. bit like us back, myself in my generation back in the 1960s, uh, the hippies. They said, I'm out of here. <laughs> oh, and then it was the hippies who became devotees. <laughs> oh, okay. That's amazing. Going back to my own experience, I was starting out as a new student at University of California, Berkeley. From day one, I saw the devotees, as I mentioned, uh, standing at the main gate in a group chanting kirtan. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting. I wonder what that's all about. And I thought, well, whatever it is, I know it's from India, and yeah, it looks really interesting, but whatever it is they're into, it's not something I can get into, because I'm a student, and I have to study, and I have to, you know, get good grades, and I have to be successful. And this is expanding. In Hong Kong, I was told by devotees, there's now competition for preschool children at the age of two and three oh, God. to get into the best preschool. <laughs> <My God. laughs> and the kids, they feel that pressure. Their parents are pressuring them. You know, you have to get ahead. You have to get ahead. So there's no, that mentality of competition, mm. uh, you know, is that conducive to spiritual life? Generally not. It'll be well, Rajagun, yeah. Tamagun, Rajaguna especially. Yeah, in India after IIT, there is, is IIMs are there, many students go there for the management degrees. And I know a couple of devotee friends who went there and they said the schedule itself was so killing <clears throat> that <clears throat> you can't even do your basic, get basic rest and basic food and other things. It's just so much so demanding. Spiritual life, there's no time at all for that. Yeah. So, yeah. That's also an aspect of it. And uh, maybe one or two last points, Maharaj. Mm. You mentioned earlier about Within the content of education, where is the department for the difference in the body and the soul? Mm. So Prabhupada did talk about uh, evolution also significantly. And that could be a whole big subject in itself. Uh, but in your outreach, have you seen that as a significant obstacle for people in, uh, in exploring spirituality? Well, I can't say I have, um, because I would say that um, ideas of evolution theory are so pervasive mm. in our culture. I personally don't, I don't get into it very much, if at all, uh, because it's you know, in terms of my academic training, I'm not a biologist. <laughs> mm, <sure. laughs> and yeah. so I kind of go in a different <clears throat> direction. Yeah. What I also found is that that evolution doesn't itself stop people from exploring spirituality. But when they come to know that we criticize evolution, that's what stops them. That's <laughs> Yes. <laughs> 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 it's almost seen that if you criticize evolution, you get branded as a right religious religious nut or something like that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So that was one part. And second part is that uh, if we consider uh, 
maybe this will take a few minutes but god was a central part of the education system from what i understood in india in the gurukuls as well as in the west most of the universities started as uh, as i think it was catholic and protestant universities if not mm. i don't if i'm not mistaken yeah. so then over the e- years they became secularized mm. and then now it is except for the religious studies there's departments there is no mention much of god so do you feel that itself has a played a significant role also in the in making modern education uh, unrecept or making modern education uh, a somewhat uh, inimical or indifferent towards the religion or towards yeah i mean the the history of how religion got reduced and then kind of removed from the university is uh it's complex in itself hmm. um there are many f- there there are many factors and um people have written about this i made some notes brief from from one author who's giving a a a short history of uh western universities so i want to refer to that he he goes back to um well to the late middle ages the development of the merchant class because europe had a very strong class division system up until mm 17th 18th centuries um but there was in the course of that time there was development of a merchant class which became very strong hmm uh very wealthy especially like in Holland and Germany and then a we can say an intellectual current developed which came to be called humanism and this had to do with looking back to uh philosopher philosophy and other areas of thought law and medicine uh from the ancient greeks the in middle ages in christian west um most of that had become completely lost and it was uh the muslim scholars well later muslim but the uh aristotle for example and then all of that got so to say rediscovered uh in um uh, in the sort of beginning of late middle ages uh printing press from you know the 15th century had a huge impact from the printing press develops in the west um protestantism for example the idea that one could learn to read and then read the bible oneself instead of just hearing it from the priest Hmm. uh was was a radical new idea and um to translate the bible could cost you your life uh at <laughs> at some points really i didn't know that yeah wow <laughs> <laughs> um was, was there something like that in our tradition also the translating the vedas huh? was a problem i don't think there was anything like that translating the vedas translating veda with the vedic yeah. or vedic literature into the bhakti tradition flourished because of the local tradition local tra- translations into vernaculars yeah vernacular that's you know they sort of go together when typically says the bhakti movement so called bhakti movement and vernacular um okay so then we go through a protestant reformation uh, and now we're in the 16th century which it's interesting is the time of lord chaitanya <laughs> uh which we may want to say is a kind of vedic reformation 
uh, and then starts the scientific revolution. And then you have Galileo um, looking at the moon and seeing that there are craters and the Ptolemaic universe gets kind of exploded. And then starts the question, where is God actually? Uh, because, you know, he's not just outside of a nice little crystal uh, sphere, which was thought was the universe, spheres within spheres. Um, mm. Then came what came to be called the Enlightenment. And now we come to a time where the notion of revelation is seriously questioned. Uh, the idea that, uh, first of all, there is such a thing, uh, that, that um, there is some source of higher knowledge. And so the effort to, the whole notion, what is knowledge, gets shifted, uh, I would say, and this starts with Aristotle in the West, uh, to what can we understand from pratyaksha, pratyaksha mm. and anumana. So it's ironic that they call this enlightenment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the enlightenment was the idea that uh, we are, the positive side, I would say, is the idea that we need to take responsibility for ourselves. We human beings need to take responsibility. We cannot simply um, depend on authority for everything. So I think there's a good side to the enlightenment. There was a mm. sense of, a new sense of personal responsibility. Then comes the French Revolution, which had huge uh, political mm. and intellectual ramifications. Mm. Uh, and then what the scholar calls the seismic power of the industrial revolution. So now we're coming into the 19th century, early, okay. early to middle to late 19th century. Mm. And along with uh, the industrial revolution, especially comes Euro European imperialism. Mm. And this was felt um, to, to the extreme by India you know, starting starting from what was it, seventeen fifty seven uh, to eighteen fifty seven, and then to nineteen forty seven. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and, but that's another subject. But uh, one um, Indian Vaishnava, not from our uh, direct uh, tradition, but a, a Gaudiya Vaishnava, nonetheless, an intellectual. He said, you know, the British uh, imperial project to India actually began in 1947. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> the, okay. the, yeah, the takeover actually started in 1947. <laughs> anyway, so then European imperialism and... Um, and then the training of those who were running the empire. So there's one building uh, in Oxford, in the Oxford University, which is now houses uh, the history department. And that was at that time, the place for the training of uh, the members of the um, the British Empire, who were then going out to administer the empire. So you see, I'm making kind of a very wide circle to bring back around to this point uh, of what modern education is about and how mm. the place for God, um, which was your initial question, how it, it faded and disappeared. So these are taking very... Uh, I'm painting with a hugely wide brush. <laughs> yes, that's true. I mean, it's almost the entire intellectual history of uh, Europe, you could say, and then it affected the whole world. Yeah. It started from the almost, I think, 12th century, 
when you mentioned about human 13th century i think we started the yeah. humanism yeah so, yeah and that's an interesting you mentioned 13th century also this was in a, in a way the high point of european theology uh scholasticism oh, with like thomas a, thomas aquinas yeah. writing his summum the the theologica, theologica yes um which in which he was trying to as one of my professors said trying to baptize aristotle okay <laughs> just trying to christianize aristotle but then what happened uh within within that tradition mm. it imploded or it exploded with william of ockham with william of ockham oh okay the ockham's razor what we talk about yes ockham's razor yes as he challenged if you have a principle which is unnecessary to explain it and so they started throwing out you know angels and whatever else uh from within theology and then at some point the question came well do we really need god oh okay i think that was what laplace laplace was asked by his he presented a thesis on math to the french emperor and french emperor asked where is god he says god he said in famously or famously that i have no need for that hypothesis yeah so yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. so it seems uh, that uh, what you talked earlier about big impact in india and uh, so the removal of god from the public square in india in the west it's quite clear how it happened but in india if we see even when the british education came to india the bhadra bhadra loka who were then bhakti vinod thakur's times they were they were definitely spiritually interested they were many of them were religious people they were trying to re- revive the religious uh revive or recover india's what they consider to be the essential or pure teachings mm-hmm. as compared to what they were what were pre- present at those times so in one sense when did god get moved out of the indian religious square maybe that's what this vaishnav scholar meant when after post independence was it i uh, it's possible i i haven't uh, studied the indian system myself yeah but i think i think it's significant that uh with the indian constitution and uh, the establishment of the indian state with the idea that um there I mean I don't know exactly how this happened but that there would be no departments for the study of religion within the university I think this has um you know takes us a long way to explain what's going on but also as perhaps you know uh this may be changing yeah. and it may be changing especially because of uh a lot of work that's been done um uh, by our our very devotee shona garishi prabhu uh the oxford center for hindu studies mm. he's he has done a lot of um meeting with with top um people in the indian education system and uh their indications of of changes to this the uh, there's there's now a department or at least a course of study at Jadavpur University in Calcutta in the sociology of religion yes so uh, what with, i read in sorry, which yes. pranava prabhu is involved yeah. so what i read about this absence of religious studies in india was that to some extent it was something like a reaction to the trauma of partition religion was attributed as a cause of the partition and the million lives were that lost so they said that let's get religion out of the educational system so that's quite possible yeah. yeah i mean i haven't really been able to find any good you could say intellectual history of india and the evolution of thoughts especially in the modern times there are good books in terms of how the various systems of philosophy developed and how they interacted mm. 
modern intellectual history of India. That, yeah, that'll be interesting. And you know, if if you find such a thing, usually it'll be written by a Marxist. <laughs> oh yeah, it's either the Marxist, or then we will have some right winger, or so, some yeah, right, some reactionary. Some right, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's it's. Uh, of course, we could say that nobody is absolutely objective, but yeah. still, at least there is some attempt to preserve objectivity. To so so we can without that it becomes very difficult to, in one sense, trust anything that we are reading. It's difficult, isn't it? Yeah. But I I want to also give credit to, um, for whatever little they do, uh, the religious institutions in India for at least in a tentative way holding courses in some sort of comparative religion. I know that they exist and, um, you know, at least they're trying in some way to do something like that, but it's extremely small. But there's oh. another point which I was thinking about the other day, and I find it interesting that you can tell me if it's still true, but I get the impression that um, middle class families, uh, mm -hmm. parents in India are eager to have their children attend Christian schools because yeah. they're considered the best. Yeah, that is true. Even I, I went to a convent school, they call it. So it's, uh -huh. uh, it's not so much uh, because they're enamored by Christianity, but it's just that the quality of education is considered to be good. And that's why. Yeah. So uh, at least in my school, there was, there was a church nearby and we could go if we wanted, but there was no explicit proselytization. But I don't think that's right. always true in all the schools. Mm. Yeah. By the way, yeah, just uh, so going back to your point about uh, the OCHS and things, I actually regarding India's, India's secular, it seems that there was opposition to including that secular in the preamble of India's constitution. So mm. when the constitution was framed, it was not there. But in the 1970s, Indira Gandhi, when you, uh, Prime Minister Shiv, she had it inserted. So it is there oh. now. Oh. So so it was a later addition. A later addition, okay. yeah. <laughs> so yeah. at that time, it seemed that <clears throat> they wanted uh, to not interfere with the religious sentiment. So the Muslim personal law was preserved. Yeah. Yeah, so, because, yeah. so for that purpose, they said that we don't want to call it secular. So, so Nehru opposed it at that time, but eventually it was incorporated by Indira Gandhi. Something you may want to do if you haven't already um, for your podcast is interview Shonakarishi Prabhu about the yes because yes, I, I think he he knows he knows a lot about it he's um, he's been involved in changing the situation and he can report what exactly is is happening on that level yeah definitely to the extent he's able to say something publicly of course some yeah. of these things are a little bit you know, going on behind the scenes. Oh, I don't know. Yes, Maj, I'll do that. That's a very good suggestion. If I already messaged him, maybe I'll do it once again. I was waiting for his reply. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So you were mentioning that the OCHS has contributed to the revival. And in some ways, even Prabhupada's emphasis that the temples be centers of learning, that is quite significant, I would say, in terms of at least the way I experience temples while living in India. Hardly any temples even had any classes. Mm. So, of course, it's a different kind of education, revival of education. But at least something is regular classes and education. So we could say even Prabhupada's legacy is continued in it's, the academic uh, department, in the academic domain by Prabhupada's followers and expanded. Yes, uh, but dare I say, um, our education in our temples is for the most part what many people would call not 
so much education, excuse me, as indoctrination. And yeah, this is a whole nother topic. And I did a presentation on this uh, for uh, the Ministry of Education a couple of years ago. And oh. I have a PowerPoint about it. So if you like, maybe we can do another uh, session and we can talk about that. That would be excellent, Mara. That would be very good. Maybe in that part, we can even bring in the, uh, the part of devotees and academia. Suitability, unsuitability. Yeah. You could talk about yeah. that. Yes. Yes, Maharaj. So, so sure, for, sure. for me, it's um, coming close to time for another engagement. But yes, maybe you want to do a, sem a you do your uh, mystical summary. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> mystical. Mystical, mystical, because you remember everything so well. <laughs> no, it's just a few things I remember here and there. But say. Um, yeah, Anish. today we discussed about the topic of broadly about it says how does modern education affect spiritual receptivity or, receptivity or spirituality in general. So you examined Prabhupada's statement that modern education is like a spiritual slaughterhouse. So overall, it seemed that Prabhupada was more concerned with the cultural implications, the culture in the university, which is quite sensual. You mentioned your experience when going back there that you're shocked at the level of uh, the degradation of the language and uh, what are the word use? Hakkas noisiness or what is it? The of the hostels. You use a particular word for that. That is I don't I don't know. So like, anyway, so what I said, but, so yeah, uh, a lot of what we say carrying on wild carrying. party partying. Partying, yeah. Yeah. So then we discussed about the, in terms of the content of the education, that the context of the education definitely affects uh, to some extent, but that is, we could say a part of the entire modern culture itself, where there is competitiveness, there's materialism, there is sensuality. So education is it itself alone culpable. Then we discussed that you said that we could look at uh, the positive side of education is that and Prabhupada himself, when he, he was educated and he was a good student and he, his uh, educational training does come out in his, in his writing and his speaking. He quotes sometimes from contemporary sources, which he learned about. So, so conversely, if you say, are the uneducated people receptive to bhakti or receptive to spirituality? He says, yes, they might have some simplicity, which might make them more receptive, but then not necessarily that they could also go into sentimentality and it might be in India, but in other countries, it depends if the culture itself fosters some openness. So maybe not in America where people already have particular religious belief, but maybe in Africa or South America, there is a receptivity. So, and we also discussed that we talked about education in the traditional setting was more of reading rather than uh, hearing. And in that sense, even if people were educated, that they were not literate, even Akbar was not literate, but it didn't matter because they would, they, through reading, they would hear and learn. And um, well, I think I meant the other way around. For most people, it's hearing. Yeah, sorry, through he so through sorry, because they couldn't read, they could hear and learn. Sorry, the, yeah. the literacy or not, they could hear and learn. And then you also talked about your experiences with, I think the, the reading religion was one book, and Houston Smith you quoted about how the scientism, media, uh, legal system, and the education, they create a tunnel view. And even, even if science is advancing rapidly, but because scientists are often not trained in philosophy, so it's just expanding the tunnel, extending the tunnel in a sense. So if we consider the content of education, you quoted how Prabhupada said that, where is the department that talks about the difference between body and the soul? And... In that connection, we discussed about how, you, and I think that, that connection came to about the whole philosophy. And then you mentioned about different levels of, was it? You went back to Arist, uh, so at the time of Socrates uh, and Ar Plato. What was the point you mentioned in that connection that? Uh, well, just the, the that, roots of the, the idea that some intentional education is needed. Yeah. 
So it seems from that time also there was a concern that if the drama started being repeated, oh yeah, you know, only yeah. philosophy alone would be the source of would preserve the wisdom or preserve the culture. So the idea that uh, then we talked about secularization and how much it has removed God from the cause God to be removed from the curricula. So you talked about the whole intellectual history of the West, and while we could say secularism might. prevent religions from fighting but having no religious education can it's not that that alone can stop people from fighting but if you have a religious education then that can foster appreciation and even a healthy culture of debate rather than mm. ignorance and then pre- misconceptions and that leading to violence now i would say there can be debate there can also be dialogue yeah dialogue and debate both yes culture of dialogue mm. and in india's all the india is sec- india secularism in india and secularism in the west has worked out differently india especially the lack of religious education religious studies is a problem which slowly is being rectified through efforts in various places aoc yes. and then you talk about that so. it's slowly being rect- slow at least some direction is going on in that direction yeah. so we could say that we also have the brc uh, yeah that is also playing connected now with university of mumbai yes from me yes maharaj So, look forward to a future podcast where we discuss about education and indoctrination, Maharaj. Okay, let's do that. I wanted to say just one more thing briefly yes, on the good side of modern education from personal experience. I've been personally fortunate to have a, f- a good number of really good teachers. Okay, and maybe they were not bringing spirituality. spirituality to me but in their areas of expertise they were such that i felt some inspiration like this is really interesting i really want to learn this and a sense of you know uh there's something more to being human uh which is uh being communicated by this teacher so i i i think that's also to be recognize that maybe in spite of the modern <laughs> education yeah. system but in any case um i've been fortunate to have many many i don't know but a good a, a, a few that i've remembered especially as being really yes. really good uh that i feel much gratitude uh for what i've uh, for having had had them as teachers Yeah, I think you, in that connection, you also mentioned that there's a certain amount of training that comes when we hear different perspectives, and then grounded in Prabhupada's books, we read other books so that there can be broader engagement with the broader in, intellectual engagement with the world. And yeah. to reduce Prabhupada's statement, the slaughterhouse is wrong because Prabhupada engaged with scholars, and Prabhupada wanted his disciples also, like Ramanuja Sarup, to do his PA, do his doctorate. Yeah. So we could say Prabhupada's approach overall was that. At, in the initial stages, protect the faith, but eventually he wanted to oh, ensure that Krishna consciousness reached intellectual respectable circles. Also, yes, yes when when you are nurturing uh, a small plant, you keep it in a small pot, and you're very careful that mm. no disturbances come to it, um, and, and maybe you need to keep a net. around it to keep all the bugs out and the birds and so on <laughs> that's quite a weird metaphor okay <laughs> and, and then but but the plant has to grow and it needs a bigger pot so maybe you need to transplant and then at some point you put it out in the garden and nice. it can grow into a big tree and uh and produce fruits that's a beautiful metaphor I, yeah i think shiva prabhupad wanted you know the full development That's a beautiful metaphor, yes, Maharaj. Thank you very much for your association today, Maharaj. Thank Hare you, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Congratulations. Jai. Thank Hare. you.